Today we jump into a brand new series uh, that I'm calling the Prayers of the People. Okay, it just sounds so official. Anybody grow up uh, Catholic or like me, Anglican, Episcopal? There's a whole section of the service called Prayers of the People. All right, that's where I'm getting this from, Prayers of the People. Now, um, in this series, uh, we're going to talk about uh, prayer. But before I get into that, we are currently in 21 days of prayer and fasting as a church. Uh, we take two seasons in the year uh, to pray. Now, in January, we pray and fast. In August, we take 21 days and we just pray. Uh, but what we are doing in this season is we are calling the church to 21 days of prayer and fasting. There's a few things that go along with that. Uh, so we're one week into that. So I'm calling the church to 14 more days of prayer and fasting. So if you're just, just hearing about this for the first time, you get to jump in now as well. Uh, but for these next 14 days, uh, we have... 7 a.m. morning prayer here at the church. Uh, Pastor Dustin leads that, and Isaac, our worship leader, plays worship for that. 7 a.m. here. It's been a great time for those in attendance to that. Also, we're going through a starving devotional. Uh, these are for purchase in the courtyard as you walk out today. This is written by one of our elders, Pastor Jess Strickland, who was here with us last week. I'm telling you, this is such a great guide uh, into getting into the presence of God, having a quiet time, devotional time. You, trust me, you want this, okay? You want to pick one of these up. We've had so many stories. That's why we keep doing it. This is probably the fifth or sixth year we've done this. We've had so many great stories of people uh, using this and the life change that comes with it. So I encourage you to pick one up on your way out. And also, uh, we have one-year uh, Bibles for you as well. Uh, what we want to do is, uh, the idea was that we can give you a, a resource at the beginning of every year, a, a Bible, that, and also kind of a devotional that you can go through day by day. It's really easy. You open it up to the day that it is, and it tells you exactly what to read, all right? I know sometimes you're like, uh, Lord, just speak to me today. <laughs> Leviticus, you know, it's like, what? Uh, so this tells you exactly what to read. It's a format. You go through it. And what I love about that is that we're all reading the same scriptures on the same day, okay? So that's the one-year Bible. That's free for you. Uh, pick one of those up as well. Okay. So we're in this 21 days of prayer. I, your pastor, have called us to this time of prayer and fasting. Why? Because we believe that prayer changes things. It's not just something Christianese that we do. You know, it's what other churches do, so we might as well do it as well. No, it's, we, we believe in it. We believe in the power of prayer. We believe that prayer changes things. And let me tell you, we're already hearing about miracles that are taking place just in these short seven days. We've already received accounts. We believe in it. So I want to bring this series, prayer, Prayers of the People. Let me give you the theme verse for this series. It's Ephesians 6, 18. It says this, pray in the spirit whenever you feel like it. No, it says in every situation. You know, most people feel, feel like, I'm going to pray, like, like just when, when, t when it feels like I should pray, like, like maybe when I'm at church, that's probably a good time to pray. Or, or maybe when, when I'm at a funeral, it just seems like appropriate, I should probably pray, right? That just seems like this is the time to pray. I'm going to pray at a funeral. Or maybe when things are really bad, like that's when I pray. But really, prayer is something we should always be doing. Like, like when you're at work, you're praying. Like when you're in the car, running errands, you're praying. Before you're about to call that person back who just chewed you out, yeah, pray then, okay? I really encourage you, pray then. Or maybe before you're about to send, that out, send out that email, that's when you really probably should pray, right? Or maybe when you're dropping your kids off at school, just pray for them. That's one of my favorite things to do when I take my kids to school. I pray for them on the way to school. And I even take it a step further. I, I recite the, we have a Zale Kids Word declaration, we recite that together. Just something that we're always doing, we're praying. And then the verse goes on, it says, use every kind of prayer and request there is. Did you know that there are many different kinds of prayers and requests that you can make? Maybe you're thinking, I had no idea. I didn't even know there were different kinds of prayers and requests. Well, there are. And what I want to do in this series is I want to show you these different types of prayers that were prayed by people in the Bible, and how we too can pray these prayers of these people to God. So to give you an example, let's look at Jesus. Jesus prayed a very famous prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer. Even non-believers have heard of the Lord's Prayer, this famous prayer. And he prayed this because the disciples came to Jesus and they asked Jesus, Jesus, how do we pray? They didn't know how to pray. And you might feel like you're in that same place. I just don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray. The disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And the Lord said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven. 
And he went through the Lord's Prayer. Now, some think that it should be verbatim. That's not what he was trying to do. This wasn't a verbatim prayer you are to pray every single day. It was an outline that he gave the disciples to pray every day. So for, for some of us, we just struggle in this area of prayer. We don't know what to pray. We don't know how to pray. We don't know if we have the right language, if we're saying the right things. And we, we struggle to pray or we just, you know what, we just don't pray at all. Well, can I make a suggestion to you today? We need a different kind of prayer, don't we? We need a different way to pray today. For some, we've been praying the same prayers, using the same words, reciting it the same way, the same time, the same location, and maybe for some of us today, prayer has become unenjoyable. It's become predictable, and for some, it's become boring. What I want to do in this series is give you some more material, like teach you new ways, give you some new ideas, show you new processes and new styles of how to pray by looking at the prayers of the people in the Bible. You know, there's many types of prayers prayed in the Bible by some really great people who teach us some impactful ways to pray to God. And I hope through this series you can find a new way or two to pray to God. Here's what I'm getting at. I just want to see you pray again. I don't know if you're honest with yourself, if you would say you pray a lot. But if you're not, I just want to encourage you this, through this series to pray again. And really, here's what I'm getting at. I just want you to enjoy it, to enjoy prayer again. So today, I want to start the series off by looking at this first person in the Bible. I want to look at this man, Moses, who some of you, most of you have heard of before. But his style of prayer that we read in scripture is known as the prayer of Moses or it's also known as the tabernacle prayer, the tabernacle prayer. So if you're taking message notes, there's a title, a notes, a notes card in the seat back pocket in front of you. The title of this morning's message is this, it's Moses' tabernacle prayer. I know you're excited you came to church. That title right there got you so excited. You're like, oh, I didn't know when I woke up this morning I'd be learning about Moses' tabernacle prayer. That's where we're going, all right, church? We're going to have fun today. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. Would you speak to us on this tabernacle prayer of Moses? We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Everybody said. I know you're excited to be here. Y'all are, y'all are the faithful right here. There's so many people watching online. They're warm, right? You guys are faithful. There's a double portion blessing in it for you today. Okay, I got to tell you, prayer is a spiritual discipline. I'm so grateful to God that prayer has been a spiritual discipline in my life for most of my life. I, I, I genuinely, honestly can stand before you and say I love prayer. I value prayer. I always have. And I think it's just how I grew up. Now, I remember when I was about five or six years old, you know you have these memories of your life that just stick with you for the rest of your life. I had this memory when I was five or six years old sitting down at the coffee table in one of my early homes with my dad as he walked through the Lord's Prayer and he taught me the Lord's Prayer. I have that vividly in my mind. My parents taught me to pray. They'd pray with me every single night. I remember that. And then I started going to a Baptist church with some friends and the Baptist taught me how to pray. Any former Baptists in this room? Like, I love, they're like, <laughs> like, I don't want to lie, so I'm going to lick my hand up, but I don't want you to see me, you know, like, no, it's, it's okay, I, I, I got saved in a Baptist church, went to Baptist college, and, and uh, man, the Baptists, they taught me how to pray, this is how the Baptists pray, this is fun, I love the Baptists, okay, the Baptists would say, you know, let's pray, so they would all stand up, and you get in a circle, and you'd hold hands, now, which was weird for me anyways, right? You're like, wait a second. Like, I thought we, we like, can't even wear pants in this religion, you know? It's like, you know, like, here we are. We're like, we get to wear, we get to, that was a joke. We get to stand and we get to wear, anyway, okay. We get to stand, you get to hold hands. And like, like they were so against any sort of like, you know, and you're holding hands, you know? I have so many stories that are going through my mind right now and I can't go there because there's a, I have what's called a filter and sometimes I struggle with it, but right now it's activated. Okay, so. And so I would, as, as like a young man, I would, I would be like, this is weird, but let me find the hottest girl in the room. I'm going to stand by her, okay? And now we're going we're gonna to hold hands. I like this thing. I like this, right? You know, the only chance I get. All right. And you, you hold hands, and the way it works is the first person starts off, 
And it goes around the circle, and when they're done, they just squeeze the hand of the person next to them. Just squeeze it, you know, just squeeze the hand, right? <laughs> you ever been in a prayer circle like this? Anybody at all? Okay, all right. Just me. All right, okay, well, yeah. Okay, so you're holding hands. And it, it's funny, because like, I'd probably be at the end, right, next to the hot girl, and then they, the person would start off, and, like, you're just sitting there thinking, like, oh, Lord, it's going to come to me in a second. Like, you know, and they're hitting everything. They're hitting family. They're hitting church. They're hitting the government. You're like, I'm running out of things to pray for. Like, I don't know what else to pray. <laughs> you know, and it just kind of keeps going down, and it's getting closer. You get a little nervous. And then this person next to you is, like, like King James only. They're like, thou says the Lord thus, and this is, and all this in life. And, and you're like, I don't even know people talk like that. Like, you know, you ever feel intimidated by someone who prays? Yeah, like this guy, you know, like. I don't like him, you know, but he prays. Uh, and, you know, and then it gets to you, right? Squeeze your hand. And the Baptists do something that no one else does. No one else does. They use one word. It's, this is like the best cop-out of life. If you're ever in that situation, you're in that circle, it's only a Baptist thing. You can say one thing, and everybody knows exactly what you're thinking. When it comes to you and you don't know what to say, what to pray, you just say, unspoken. And then you hit the hand next to you unspoken. Only the Baptists do it, and I love it. It's just a Baptist thing. Okay, so that's a Baptist prayer right there, y'all. That's what that's like. Okay, so I grew up doing that, right? And then, and then a youth group, we would have, we'd have all night prayer services, all night. Have you ever stayed up all night praying? I didn't either. You know, it's just like, I struggle to pray for five minutes. They're like, go all night. I'm like, give me a map. I don't, we'll start with Russia. I don't know. Like, I think they need prayer. Let's start there, you know? Like, I don't know. Just Pray all night, you know, so I, I would get in these situations as a young man and just learn how to pray. And I grew up praying and I learned how to make this a spiritual discipline in my life. And that leads me to this point in my life. I'm telling you, when we started this church, this church was founded upon prayer. All those years of doing these things, this church was founded upon prayer. Before we did anything in this church, we prayed. We prayed. We're from Dallas. And we moved, when we moved here, we are just visiting. We would just come up. We'd just drive the, ro the roads and just pray. We didn't know what else to do. We just prayed. And we'd, I'd go over to the Capitol. I'd just park my car and I'd just walk the Capitol and I'd just pray. And then when we finally moved here, we didn't have anybody to meet with yet. So we just would stop at the school and we'd just walk around the school and pray over the school. This is what we did. This, this church was founded upon prayer. Prayer is a value for my life. It's a value for this church and I want prayer to be a value for you as well. So today I want to teach you the prayer of Moses. I believe this prayer and the way you pray this prayer will help you in your prayer life. See, Moses was a man chosen by God to lead the chosen people of God out of slavery in Egypt under the rule of Pharaoh and into the promised land that God had for his people. Well, they say that there's about 4 million people in slavery that Moses had to lead out of slavery into the promised land. And they were in slavery in Egypt. And Moses had to lead them all the way to the promised land, which is modern-day Israel. That journey should have taken about a couple weeks, a few weeks. But as we know, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But when they finally make it there, they were to make a temple for God to dwell in. They were to build, to construct an actual building, a temple for God to dwell in. You see, back in those days, God dwelt in buildings, but today God dwells in the hearts of believers. You see, this building that we are in right now, this home, <laughs> this amazing, epic home, right? This is, this is not the sanctuary. We are the sanctuaries of God. Another thing, back in those days, God would write laws on tablets, but today, God writes laws on our hearts. So these people were on this journey, and before they got there, they needed a temporary place because they realized the journey was becoming long. They needed a temporary building and able for God to dwell inside of. You see, they were portable. They were on the move. They were led by cloud by the day and fire by night. And this permanent building was called a temple. They were one day going to build it, but the temporary building that they needed to have is called a tabernacle. So, so the permanent building is the temple, and the portable building is the tabernacle. See, tabernacle means portable church. We were a portable church for four months, 
and I hated every month of it, all right? Like it was terrible. Some challenging times during that. So some would call this the tabernacle prayer. Let me show it to you, Exodus 25, 8 through, 8 through 9. It says this, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. Which is what God wants to do in you, by the way. Holy means to be set apart. He wants to set you apart from all the world, and he wants to do it through a relationship with you. Except today, you don't need to build him a building. You have to have him in your hearts. So you must build this tabernacle, it goes on to say, and its fur furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will show you. So what I want to do in this message is show you the pattern that God instructed them to build the actual tabernacle. I believe it's a pattern for us and how we pray. So this is what the tabernacle looked like. Let me show you a picture of this right here. I drew this, by the way. No, I didn't. I'm lying to you. Uh, this is a great illustration here, uh, <laughs> driven, driven by a five-year-old. And it's the tabernacle. So this is uh, what the tabernacle looked like. You had the gates right here. You had two pieces of furniture. And then you had a tent. And inside the tent, you had four pieces of furniture and also a smaller tent with a piece of furniture in that as well called the Holy of Holies. This is the tabernacle right here. In order to meet with God, the high priest or Moses would have to go through a process, would have to go through every piece of furniture before they actually got to the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies, and that is where God's presence dwelt. But here's the deal, if they didn't go through the process the correct way, they would be killed immediately. They had to go through it the proper way exactly through the process to meet with God, and if they didn't, they'd be killed. They would even put a, 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 like a, an anklet of bells on their ankle and tie it to a rope, and if they heard the, the Christmas bells, they would pull them out. You know, they'd pull, that's messed up, but they'd pull them out, all right? So here, here's what I want you to catch on this. That, that God is a God of order. God's a God of order. There is a process when you meet with God, and it had to be obeyed. I'll say this too, Zao is a place of order. That's why we want order. We're not just letting people come up and speak and people got flags and people are like dancing and stuff because it'd be I would be distracted by that, right? You would be too, you know, because we believe in order. God is a God of order. That's where God's, God dwells when there is order. Okay, so this, this was a process. You go out of order, you die, but you got to go, go through, through the order, go through the process. That's when you meet with God. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't go through a process, you're going to die. But here's what I am saying. I think some of you are spiritually dying because you don't have order. We're so worried about, okay, if i got to go through the process and, you know, to meet with God, and, and if I don't, I'll die. That's what they were thinking. But I would think that us today, for so many of us, we have no order when it comes to our spiritual life, and we are spiritually dead. Exodus 33, 11 says this, inside the tent of meeting... The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Did you know that that's what God wants for you? He, he wants to speak to you face to face as if you were best of friends. I believe if you knew how to pray and you knew how to connect with the Father, you would indeed experience this right here, this friendship. This is how God intended prayer. It's as easy as speaking to a good friend. You know when you're with that friend, it's just as easy to talk to, it's comfortable, it's enjoyable. That's what God wants with you. Okay, so you might be saying, well, that's, that's Old Testament, Jared. We're, we're obviously dwelling in the Old Testament here. Well, let me just show you what Jesus says about the Old Testament when he's speaking in the New Testament. Here he says, Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I've come to abolish all of that, <laughs> the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So I, I understand that it's Old Testament, that because it's Old Testament doesn't mean that it's pointless. This means that the law might not be there anymore, but the meaning is still there. The principles are still there. The benefits for you are still there. So I believe we could take everything that God made law in the Old Testament, and today we can find the meaning behind it and the fulfillment in it. Okay. This is one of my favorite ways to pray. I want to show you this process of how they would go through the temple. 
or the tabernacle, sorry. I want to show you how they'd go through the tabernacle. I want to show you the process in which I pray when I go through this tabernacle prayer of Moses. Okay, so the first part is you on the outer courts coming into the inner gates. Okay, we're coming, you're, you're, on, the, you're on the outskirts coming into the outer courts. Okay, and this is called the outer courts. And for us in the New Testament now, this is when we thank and praise God. This is when we thank and praise God. So let me show you again the tabernacle uh, picture. They would, they would be standing on the outside, the outskirts, and they would come through the gates into the outer courts. And they're now in the tabernacle. They're in the outer courts of the tabernacle. And when they would do this, they would come into the outer courts with one thing in mind, and that was to give thanks to God. Like, I thank you, I'm here. God, thank you for what you've done. Thank you that you've brought me this far. Thank you for the blessings in my life. They're, the one thing on their mind is thank and praise God. Before they wanted to meet with God, they wanted to thank God. What does that mean for us in prayer today? Before you ask God for what you want, you need to thank God for what you have. So when you come to prayer Come to meet with God in prayer. I understand you have needs, you have desires, you have wants. Man, but as you enter into the presence of God, first enter in with thanksgiving. Enter in with gratitude. You know gratitude is one of the healthiest emotions you can have? Gratitude turns what you have into what you have being enough. Gratitude says, I, I have some needs, but Lord, if you... Don't answer another prayer of mine. Man, I already have so much that you've given me, and I'm content with just that. You've saved me. You've forgiven me. You've given me eternal life. You've given me life on earth. Thank you, God. I'm content. Psalm 104 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving in his courts of praise. Give him, give thanks to him, and praise his name. See, when you come to God... You come in with thanks and praise. Before you give them the laundry list, you give them praise. When I start out my time with God, I always start out by listening to worship music. And I just think about all he's done, all he's given me, and I thank him for all the blessings. That's one of the reasons we start out in worship here in a church service. Because before we learn and we grow and we begin to ask God for things, we just want to come in and just praise him. We praise his name. That's why our worship is focused on him, not us. We're praising him. So we come into the outer courts with thanksgiving and praise on our minds. Okay, then we're going to come in and we're going to encounter this first piece of furniture, which might be a very odd piece of furniture. You probably have it in your home. This is called the brazen altar, okay? This is the altar where animals are sacrificed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's also known as a grill, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Dustin. All right. So the first piece of furniture that you would encounter is the brazen altar, which for us in the New Testament here is the cross. Remember, they were on a journey to meet with God. They, they could not meet with God whenever they wanted to. So, so the, the Moses, so the high priest, is on a journey, going through a process to meet with God. So they're going through the process, and the very first thing that they do that they encounter is an altar with an animal on the altar to be sacrificed. And that priest would go over and kill the spotless, perfect animal, and blood would go everywhere. You ever, done a, you ever gut a deer? It's everywhere. Blood's everywhere. Isn't that a weird thing to come into the, try to get to the presence of God, and here we have to go through an altar and a pool of blood? Meaning this, in order to meet with God, something needs to be sacrificed. Very first thing. The Old Testament tells us that it's the blood that covers sins. So a spotless animal would be chosen and would be sacrificed on the altar, and its blood would be shed for the forgiveness of the one who's making the sacrifice. That blood covers the sins of the person. So you might ask, well, what's the application for us today? We're not sacrificing animals in service today, right? It's the cross. The only reason that we can go to God is because Jesus sacrificed himself for us on the cross. 
If you want a short gospel message, here it is. Our sins needed to be atoned for. So Jesus, the spotless lamb, shed his blood on the cross and he sacrificed himself for us, mankind, so that we might be forgiven. So now because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we now have access to God 24-7. And no one's excited about that. All right, I'm going to preach a little harder for you. Okay, let me, I got this. You can do this. The Bible says you can now approach God boldly and confidently because of Jesus' sacrifice. So for me, I come into prayer, I thank him, I praise him, and then I begin to think about Jesus. I picture the cross. I picture Jesus on that cross. I make it personal that Jesus went to that cross for me and for my sin. Romans 5, 6 says this, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. It was my sin that put him up on that cross. He paid the price for me. And it was a debt that I could not pay, and Jesus chose to step in and pay it for me. I could preach a whole sermon on this, but I want to give you a little sermonette in the sermon, all right? I'm going I'm to show you real quick. As we think about Jesus, I'm going to give you four wounds of the cross. There were four wounds of the cross. First, it was his hands and his feet were pierced. Second, it it was his body that was whipped. Third, it was his head that was crowned with thorns. And fourth, it was his heart that was pierced with a spear. So, So prophetically, hundreds of years before the cross, get this, I find this so amazing. This is why you know your Bible's real. The prophet Isaiah prophesied these four wounds. Check this out. Isaiah 53, 5 says this, but he was pierced for our rebellion. There's the first one. Rebellion. This is when we do something other than what God has instructed us to do. It's when we go too far in our own desires and we realize we're going in a different way than what God has instructed us to do. We were rebelling against God. He was pierced for that. We'll get this, church. What was he pierced in? He was pierced in his hands and his feet. Get this. How do you rebel against God? With your hands and your feet. So God was pierced and took the pain in his hands and his feet for what our hands and feet did. He was pierced for our rebellion. He was also crushed for our sins. Sins. You know, sins are different than rebellion. Rebellion is what you did. Sin is who you are. Let me explain this for a second. The Bible says that we were born sinful and separated from God. It's the things that are inside of you that you don't really like that they're there, but they're still there. It was was those that you were born with. He was crushed for that. Well, where was he crushed? In his heart. He took a spear in the heart. What's born sinful? Our hearts are born sinful. And on the cross, he took a spear in his heart. And his heart was crushed so that your heart could be made clean. He was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. And he was beaten so we could be made whole. He was beaten so we could be made whole. The beating he took was the crown of thorns on his head. You know, the, crowns of, the crown of thorns, it says, was beaten into his skull, meaning it was beaten into his brain. Think about this. Where are we not whole in? Our thinking. We have lack of peace, of lack of, of, of confidence. We have anxiety, impure thoughts, depression. It's, it's in the head. It's in our thinking. And Jesus took the beating of the crown of thorns in his head so that our thoughts could be made whole. Now we can think healthy and properly. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be made whole, and he was whipped so we could be healed. Whipped, it was the lashes. It was the cat of nine tails whipping Jesus so that we would be made whole. But when you're sick, what's sick? Your body is sick. And Jesus took the whipping on his body so that your body could be made whole and you could be healed. This is why we believe in healing. Not because you deserve it or you're worthy of it. Go to that scripture one more time, Dave. Scripture, sorry. Yep, we're going to... All right, here we go. Um, 
He was whipped so that we could be healed. I think when you refuse to believe in healing, you're refusing to believe that he was even whipped. He was whipped so that you could be healed. We believe in this. So when I think about Jesus, I think about his hands and his feet being pierced for my rebellion. I think about his heart being crushed for my sinful heart. I think about the crown of thorns that were beaten into his head so that I can have a wholeness of thinking and mind. His whipping that he endured, now I can be healed in the body. Okay, so we come into his presence with thanksgiving and we're praising and we thank him. Then we begin to think about Jesus. Think about what Jesus did in order to gain access for us to God. And then we pass by this blood sacrifice and we move into the next piece of furniture here, which is the brazen altar, or brazen lever, sorry. It's the lever. Now, this is, this is if you think about it, you're, you just sacrificed an animal and you have blood all over your hands. And you're going to meet with God, right? Well, what's next? You've got to clean yourself up. And you find yourself at this bowl, this double bowl thing here, and it's full of water, but also full of mirrors. And, and here's what you're doing. As you're covered in blood, you're going to clean yourself. You're washing yourself of the blood, and you're looking at yourself while you're doing it. After you made the blood sacrifice, you'd wash yourself, looking at yourself, realizing that you are the reason for the sacrifice, and now you yourself must sacrifice your life. I'm the reason for this blood. It was my sins that needed the covering of this blood. Wash yourself off. Now I offer myself as a sacrifice. You know, the Bible instructs us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Romans 12.1 says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Good news here, living sacrifice. You get to live. What does that mean? God doesn't want dead animals anymore. He wants you. So how do we sacrifice our bodies? Let me show you what this looks like for me. In my time of prayer, I'll stop and I'll go through my body. And I'll say, God, I give you my mind. I sacrifice my mind to you today. God, give me your thoughts. I want your thinking. Help me to think only what is excellent and pleasing and praiseworthy to you, Father. God, I give you my eyes. The Bible says I made a covenant with my eyes so that I might not sin against you. God, help me to, to, to view things properly today. God, I give you my mouth. Lord, help us. Some of us need this one right here. God, I give you my mouth. I commit to speaking well of others, speaking life into situations. God, I give you my, my ears. Lord, help me to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Help me to tune in to what you want me to hear today. God, I give you my hands. Lord, may, may you use my hands today to be a blessing and to build others up. Lord, bless my feet today. I give them to you today. Guide me into conversations that you want me to have. Order my steps today. Order my steps today. I surrender. I submit this. I sacrifice my body to you. We're offering our bodies up as a living sacrifice. It's an act of worship. You know, when you offer up your body, it's not yours anymore. You've offered your body up to your spouse. It's not, it's not another spouse's. Once you offer it up to somebody, it is now theirs. That means we can't keep doing the things that we used to do. Our bodies now belong to God, used for his plans and his purposes. You've sacrificed it. And you can't undo a sacrifice. Once it's sacrificed, it's dead. It's not coming back to life. So in prayer, after I thank God and after I think about Jesus, I sacrifice myself to him, all of me, for all of you. I'm, I'm yours. Use me for your honor and for your glory today. And now we enter into the tent. We go into the tent where there's going to be, see four pieces of furniture here before we get to the ark. First thing we're going to encounter is the candlestick. The candlestick. This candlestick... Uh, was the first thing you would encounter as you come into the tent. And for us in the New Testament, this is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you about this candlestick. The candlestick was the first piece of furniture of four pieces. It was a seven-pronged Jewish Hebrew candlestick 
that was lit. It represents fire. It represents power. It represents safety, anointing. It represents gifts. So for us, when we pray, we, this is representing the Holy Spirit. We are asking for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Spirit in our lives. Remember, Jesus even said, it's better that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come. Meaning, I can only be one place at one time. The Holy Spirit can dwell every believer always. Holy Spirit's going to guide us. He's going to comfort us. He's going to give us wisdom. He's going he's to uh, convict us of our sin. He's going to lead us into righteousness. So I pray. Every day I wake up and say, Holy Spirit, fill and empower me today with your spirit. Fill and empower me today with your spirit. Empower, empower, empower. That's what I think, empower. I pray about, I pray about my life. I pray about what I'm doing. Holy Spirit, guide me as I lead this church. I've never lit, led a church like this or this far in the journey. I need wisdom for tomorrow. I need wisdom for today. Guide me. I'm not building my church. I'm building your church. I need your wisdom, not the wisdom of man. For you business leaders, God, lead me in this business today. Help me to lead my employees and make the right decisions today. Take on the right business and do the right deals. Lead me in that today. You, you need this. Because you're going to get a deal, an offer that's going to come that you're not supposed to take. But it's going to look really good. But if you pray about it, God's going to tell you to shut it down because he has something better for you. But our wisdom says that deal looks pretty good. We take it and we regret it. We need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Parents, God, lead this family. It's yours. We follow you. We're asking God to do what only he can do here in the flesh. 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7 says this, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid, my, when I laid my hands on you. He hear me on this. Every single one of you have a spiritual gift, whether you realize it or not. You do. And, and there is a gift that God has put on the inside of you that he wants you to operate in. Whether you realize it or not, you are called, you are chosen today, church. Not, and I know when, I, when you hear that, you may go, oh, that's nice. Somebody here is called and chosen. No, you, I'm talking to you, you are called and you are chosen. There's a gift on the inside of you that God wants to fan into flames, fan into flames. Why? Verse 7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but power, love, and self-discipline. You see, when you walk in the Holy Spirit, when you allow that to be fanned into flames on the inside of you, you begin to live a different life. You live a better life than the one that you've chosen for yourself. Because now God is leading you. So, so here we are in the tents. We're at the candlestick. We ask for more of the Holy Spirit. And then we encounter this next piece of furniture in the tent. Here's where we're at now. We now encounter the table of showbread. The table of showbread. And for us in the New Testament here, this is God's word. Let me tell you about the table of showbread. There's this table on it. And on this table, you have 12 freshly baked loaves of bread. 12 freshly baked loaves of bread. Extra gluten, all right? No gluten-free here, all right? No gluten-free, extra gluten. Have you ever been somewhere where, where they just bake some fresh bread Yes, Jesus, uh-huh, yeah, he's here, right? I mean, you just smell that, you, you know? I mean, like, Gary blessed us with some fresh bread just last weekend. I mean, I just, just when, you, when you bake some fresh bread, like, don't you just love that, the smell? I mean, my grandma used to bake fresh bread, and I can still smell it. Like, that scent stays with me. So you would have seen this fresh bread on the table of showbread, and you would have been enticed by it. You would have come over, you would have eaten of the bread and nourished yourself. This table represents the word of God for us today. So at this point in my prayer time, I'll take out my Bible or I'll grab the one-year Bible. And I'll begin to read as much time as I have for this. I say it that way because I'm just as busy as you guys. I, I don't have hours to read the Bible, although I wish I did, but I don't. So I might read a chapter or two. Or I might even read one verse. Like whatever you got time for, you at least have time for one verse. Okay, you at least have time for one verse. You, 
don't buy into the lie that I got to read three chapters today or else God will hate me, you know? Like, it's okay. If you can read one or two verses, that is good enough, okay? Even though that's like some crumbs of the bread, it's at least something, all right? I just want to encourage you today to pick up your Bible and read, even if it's for only a few verses. But in my prayer time, I'll read the Bible or the one-year Bible. And I'll just begin to, and you might say, well, how's that prayer? What I'm doing is I'm reading God's truth and his promises and I'm, and I'm praying that over my life. I believe what you said in this scripture, and I'm going to adopt that. I'm going to pray that right now in my life. I'm also thinking about lies that I'm believing that the enemy has given me, and I'm replacing it with the truth of God's word. That, that's not true. That's not how you think of me. That's not what you've done for me. Your Bible and your word says this, and I begin to pray that and speak that over my life. The word of God is nourishing to us. I'm, here's what I'm doing, and it's weird to say it this way, and I'll, I'll explain why, but I'm eating I'm eating the word. I'm eating the, the words of God. Let me say it why. Matthew 4, 4, this is how Jesus said it. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, physical bread, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay, so you eat every day, so you should eat every day. Y you eat physically every day, so you should eat spiritually every day. You need to eat spiritually. And I would encourage you to grab a Bible that's free for you and begin to read it and nourish yourself if you want to survive. You're not going to last long if you don't eat physically. You're not going to last long if you don't eat spiritually. You wonder why you're being attacked. You don't know how to respond. Everything feels like it's falling apart. It's because you are, you're malnourished. You, you can't survive that way. See, what I love about this fast is that we're starving out the flesh. This, we always call it starving. This book's called Starving the Devotional. We're starving out the flesh, and we're feeding the spirit with what? We're feeding it with the word of God. So this is also a great time, too, just to encourage you to declare over yourself that I am going to live my life according to the word of God. Because there's a lot of other methods and ways you should live your life, says culture. And you're saying, ah, I get it that that's your truth, <laughs> I get it that that's what you think. I choose to live my life according to the word of God today. Culture is not my standard. The word of God is my standard. Okay, so candlestick, table showbread. Then there's one more piece of furniture before we get to the ark where God is. And here's the sixth, sixth part of the process, and that is the altar of incense. Altar of incense. And this for us in the New Testament, this is worship. This is worship. So the altar of incense, it's this little altar, goes about waist high, that's small, but it's burning with incense. I mean, those incense made the place smell like Bath and Body Works. You know that smell? Like you walk in, and you're like, whoa, what just hit me? You know, and like it's, it's an aroma that's just all over the tent. <laughs> that and the bread would smell really interesting in there. But so incense. Incense is the best smell to God. I can prove it to you, and here's why. Because incense is also known as worship in Scripture. So this is worship, but worship is different than praise. Worship is different than praise. You see, when we praised him in the beginning, we praised him for what he did. Now at the altar, catch this, church. Now at the altar, we worship him for who he is. I'm going to say it again. When we praised him in the beginning, we praised him for what he did. God, you've blessed me. You've provided for me. I've seen your hand of provision in my life. You've done this for me. But now I'm at this place. I'm at the altar of incense. And now I'm worshiping you for who you are, God. So we thank him for all the blessings, for what he's given us. And this is just where we tell him, God, but if I didn't have any of that, you're still worthy. You're good not because of what you've done for me. You're good because of who you are. It's who you are. It's your character. You can't not be good. You, you are good. And your worth is not contingent on my circumstances. You are worthy regardless of my circumstances. This is worship. And this is a great time that I would just get on my knees begin to worship God. There's something about getting on your knees. 
that's humbling. I feel kind of awkward up here in front of you. It, it can hurt. I've got sensitive knees. <laughs> Just made that up. <laughs> I, I don't want to get dirty, you know. There's something about getting on your knees. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you got on your knees before God? There's a quote that says, a man on his face cannot fall far from that position. Psalm 95, 67 says, come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Let's get on our knees and worship him in our quiet times. We're ascribing worth to his name. You know, a person's worth is found in their name. I mean, your name means a lot to you. A person's worth is found in their name. So I like to call out the names of God. Proverbs 18, 10 10 says this, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. So I say, God, you are righteous. You are safety. You are holy. You are the defender. You are the provider. You are the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I begin to to, to ascribe worth to his name. Last week, my dad finally retired. My dad's 74 years old and finally retired. I actually texted him this morning. I'm like, how long did you work for? 74 years old. He just retired after 58 years of working. My dad's my hero. I love my dad so much and I'm so proud of him and I mean, we don't have this like sappy relationship or anything but that's a big accomplishment. So I just texted him. I said, Dad, I'm so proud of you. You've worked so hard. You've provided for this family. Thank you. I love you and I'm honored that you're my dad. Now go enjoy retirement. I'm ascribing worth to his name. We, we do this with people too. We get to come to God and say, God, you are my healer. You are my provider. You are my protector. It's who you are. Putting worth to his name. You're worthy of my praise. So let's recap. We thank God. We reflect on Jesus and the cross. We offer ourselves as an offering. We ask the Holy Spirit to fan into flames on the inside of us. We read the word of God and we pray it over our life. We worship God for who he is. And then finally leads us to the last piece of the process. And that is the Ark of the Covenant. Come on, y'all seen Indiana Jones, the Ark of the Covenant. And this for us, the New Testament, this is where we intercede for others. So this is the Ark of the Covenant, and, and honestly, the movie had it pretty good. So there was two angels on this little pedestal bench-looking thing, and two angels that were, 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 were faced towards the middle. And, and they actually called the middle there the mercy seat of God, the mercy seat. And it, and it was where the Spirit of God dwelt between, within the, the angels right there in the middle. Cloud of fire right there. So, so Moses, so the high priest would have to go through this process in order to get to the presence of God. But for us today, God's living on the inside of us all the time. So that kind of changes things. So now we've gone through the process with God the whole time. We came into his courts and we gave him praise. We met him right when we walked into the tabernacle. And we go through this process. We, we think about Jesus, what he's done for us. We're having a moment there. We're, we're, we're sacrificing ourselves. We're going to the candlestick, the, the table. And we're going to the altar of incense. We are, we're having this moment with God because God's with us all the time. They had to go through the process to get to God. We get God all the time. I got to tell you, I do this every day for you. When I get to this part, I now get to take my attention off of what God's done for me and what I'm struggling with or going through. And now I just get to put it on others. We need to intercede on behalf of others. So when I get to this point, I start lifting up other people, my friends, my family. I lift up this church. I lift up you. I think about people, and I lift you up by name. I pray for our city. I pray for our leaders. I pray for other churches and other pastors. 
1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2 says this, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. It's biblical for us to pray for our leaders. It's biblical for you to pray for your leaders. So, so in this moment, I begin to pray for our leaders. And one thing I think about is I might be in authority here, but I'm also a man under authority. So I pray for my overseers. I pray for our elders. I pray for our pastors. I pray for my parents. So I'm under their authority. It's important for us to pray for others. I consider it an honor and a privilege to pray for others. So we've gone through this process, and I love that this is the final part. We get to pray for other people. Church, I, I want you to be passionate about prayer. If you're struggling in the area of prayer, I hope this message helps you. If you don't know how to pray, I hope this process helps you. There's so many great outlines in the Bible. We'll bring you a few more in the upcoming weeks. You don't have to remember the seven pieces of furniture or the focuses. Just remember this outline, and it will transform your prayer life. And who knows, you actually might enjoy prayer. I want to leave you with this mantra right here. Think about this. We pray first. We pray first. When we don't know what to pray, we pray first. When we know what we probably should be praying, we pray first. When we don't know what to do, we pray. When we probably know what we should do, we pray anyways. We pray first. Prayer should be your first response. I'll leave you with this right here. Prayer should always be our first response, not our last resort. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads where you are? I don't want to pray for you as we close and get you out of here. Just take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to me through this message today? Let me speak to you. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to this earth. He did so much for us, but one of those things he did was he made a way for us to connect with you. I just think about, the, we have the greatest tool in prayer, that we can actually move heaven and earth. We can actually change your mind on things. I'd love to show that to our church in scripture, but we can actually change your mind on things through prayer. But yet some of us are bored by it or don't know how to do it or confused by it. Lord, I pray that in this series you would give us a passion for prayer. You would remind us what prayer is all about. It's about connecting with you as a friend. So Lord, I just pray you would speak to our hearts right now on this subject of prayer. Fan into flame on the inside of us this passion for prayer. And I want to close like I always want to pray for those who have never made a decision to trust and to follow Jesus. You know, Pastor Jess was here last week and he said something that was so profound that we have a moment, we have an opportunity not to put our faith in Jesus, but to take on the faith of Jesus. That is transformational. That we can take on the faith of Jesus, that's salvation. If you've never had a moment of praying and believing upon Jesus, and taking on the faith of Jesus and living as he would have you to live on this earth, I want to lead you in a prayer as we close this service, right where you're at. If you want to become a believer today, if you want to trust in Jesus today, you want to receive Jesus today, you want to take on the faith of Jesus today, I want to lead you in a prayer right where you're at. Just say, God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross in my place for my sins so that I can have relationship with you. Forgive me of my sins. I confess my belief in you today, and I receive you as my Savior and Lord, and I receive the faith of Jesus today, and I commit to walking in that. Change me from the inside out. I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we clap and celebrate those who prayed that prayer? Amen.